Welcome to this 23-part series on the book of Revelation and understanding Revelation. This is a series of Bible studies, and for these Bible studies, you will need a Bible, paper and pen for taking notes. So let's get started. Part 7, Revelation's End Time Judgment. When we studied the subject of the judgment, we discovered that God has appointed a specific time for the judgment to begin. See Acts chapter 17, verse 31. Then in our last session, we discovered an important prophecy in Daniel that deals with an appointed time at the end. See Daniel chapter 8, verse 17 and 19. This vision led us into a discussion of the cleansing of the sanctuary. See Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, which we discovered was a reference to the Day of Atonement, a special annual feast the Israelites regarded as a day of judgment. The angel Gabriel told Daniel that the cleansing of the sanctuary was going to take place in 2300 days, which in Bible prophecy represents 2300 years. See Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6 and Numbers chapter 14 verse 34. In Exodus chapter 25 verse 8 and 9, God instructs Moses to build an earthly sanctuary according to a plan that he was shown. See also Acts chapter 7 verse 44 and Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5. This plan was a blueprint based on a sanctuary in heaven. The ancient Israelite sanctuary was a type or shadow of the ministry of our heavenly high priest Jesus Christ in heaven's sanctuary. See Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1 and 2. Everything that took place in the earthly sanctuary foreshadowed some aspect of Christ's ministry for our sinful world. Even the furniture and physical layout, see Hebrews 9 verse 1 to 6, pointed to Christ. The sanctuary was divided into two compartments, the holy place and the most holy place. In the holy place, you could find a golden candlestick pointing to the light of the world. See John chapter 8, verse 12. A table of shoe bread pointing to the bread of life. See John chapter 6, verse 35 and 51. And an altar of incense representing the prayers of the saints ascending to God. See Revelation chapter 8, verse 4. In the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, with two angels perched on the lid, representing the throne of God. It was literally the place where the presence of God rested when he was in the sanctuary. See, for example, Exodus chapter 25, verse 22, Exodus chapter 40, verse 34 to 38, 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 6 to 13, and Psalm 99 and verse 1. Inside the ark was the Ten Commandment moral law of God, representing the fact that God's government is based on the rule of law. Of course, as sinners, we have transgressed that law and are in desperate need of a merciful Savior. We might notice that the lid on the ark is called the mercy seat. Our God is not only perfectly just, He is also perfectly merciful. In Psalm chapter 99 verse 1 points out something especially interesting. Not only did God dwell between the cherubim in the earthly sanctuary, apparently he dwells between the cherubim in heaven's sanctuary too. In fact, before Lucifer fell into sin, he was one of the cherubs that stood right next to the throne of God, a covering cherub See Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 16. This is confirmation that the ark in the earthly sanctuary was a model of a greater reality in heaven's sanctuary, the throne of God. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, the temple of God is opened in heaven, and John is given a glimpse, the ark or throne of God. The earthly priests went into the holy place every day, 
sins were symbolically transferred from penitent sinners into the sanctuary. Blood from sacrificial animals, pointing out our need for the blood of Christ, was sprinkled against the veil between the holy and the most holy places toward the throne of God and the mercy seat. In this way, the Israelites expressed faith in God's plan of salvation and the Messiah to come. The priests did not, however, go into the most holy place on a routine basis. Only the high priest went into the most holy place, and then only once a year. See Hebrews chapter 9, verse 7. This happened on the Day of Atonement, when the sanctuary was cleansed of all the sins that had been symbolically transferred into it. See Leviticus chapter 16, verse 16 to 19. Teaches that first the holy place and the outer courtyard were symbolically cleansed. Then, according to Leviticus chapter 16, verses 7 to 10, 15, and 16, two goats were selected. One of them was to be the Lord's goat, and the other was to be the scapegoat. Aaron, the high priest, sacrificed the Lord's goat and sprinkled its blood seven times before the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. Thus, the sanctuary was cleansed. Sin was symbolically eradicated by the blood of Christ. If you look at Leviticus chapter 16, verses 20 to 22, tells us that the sins from the sanctuary were then symbolically placed on the scapegoat, and it was driven out into the wilderness to die. The entire year's sins were thus considered completely abolished. This system of cleansing the sanctuary went on year after year for hundreds of years. But when Christ came and died on the cross of Calvary, this system of sacrifices was no longer needed because the Lamb of God, to whom all the sacrificial animals pointed, had been slain for our sins once and for all. See Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. The veil in the temple was torn in two the moment Christ died, signifying that the sacrificial system in earth's sanctuary had come to an end. See Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. According to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, when Jesus returned to heaven, he went into the heavenly sanctuary to serve as our high priest. There, he presents his blood before the throne of God as the perfect sacrifice to save sinners. He appears in the presence of God for us. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, reminds us that he serves as our advocate. For the last 2,000 years or so, Jesus has been representing sinners in heaven's sanctuary. When a sinner confesses and repents, the blood of Christ covers his sins. Jesus paid the full price of salvation at the cross. Sin will not be permitted to go on forever, however. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26 to 28, we are told that once in the end of the world, Jesus will put away sin forever. When he returns, it will be without sin. See Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. There will come a time when it will be too late to place your sins on Christ. There will be a cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. The earthly cleansing pointed forward to this, and the sin problem will be done away with. The prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, points us forward to this time. This is the longest time prophecy in the entire Bible. Daniel is told that there will be 2,300 years until the sanctuary is cleansed, or the heavenly judgment will convene. Daniel doesn't understand this vision, and for the moment no further explanation is given. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel is praying for understanding, and in Daniel chapter 9, verse 21 to 23, Gabriel returns to help Daniel understand the vision a little better. To help Daniel understand, Gabriel gives him another vision by which to understand and calculate the first. See Daniel chapter 9, verse 25 to 27. Daniel is told that 70 weeks are determined, 
or literally cut off from the 2300-year prophecy for his people. Who are Daniel's people? The Jews. The 2300-year prophecy is divided into two parts for simplicity's sake. The first 70 weeks, 70 times 7, equals 490 years, is for the Jewish people. The remaining 1,810 years take us down to the time of the judgment. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, we learn that the date that marks the beginning of both the 490 years for the Jews and the 2300 years until the judgment is when the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem is given. This date is easy to calculate. In 457 BC, the Persian king Artaxerxes sent the Jews back to Jerusalem, along with all the supplies they would need to rebuild Jerusalem. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 13, verse 20, 23, and 27, if you add 490 years to 457 BC, you come to 34 AD. Remember that you must add a year when you cross the BC AD line. AD 34 happens to be the year that Stephen was stoned and the gospel was taken to the Gentile world. No wonder the angel said that 490 years were for the Jews. Today the gospel is for everyone. Anyone who professes Jesus Christ as Savior is considered an Israelite. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 46 to 50. Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 to 29. Romans chapter 2, verse 28, 29. Chapter 10, verse 12. We are given even more detail. If you look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, it tells us that the Messiah would appear after seven weeks and three score and two weeks. That's a total of 69 prophetic weeks, or 483 years. That takes us to 27 AD, the very year that Jesus was baptized and began his ministry as the Messiah. In Luke chapter 3 verse 1 tells us that he was baptized in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. In Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 tells us that sometime after 27 AD Jesus would be cut off and then after that the sanctuary in the city would be destroyed. Compare with Matthew chapter 23 verse 37 to 39 chapter 24 and verse 2. True to God's word, Jerusalem was ransacked by the Roman general Titus in 70 AD. Then in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, we're told that Jesus would confirm the covenant with the Jews for one week or seven years. This is precisely the period of time between 27 AD his baptism, and 34 AD, when the gospel went to the Gentiles. In the middle of this period, he was cut off. If you look at Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 8, for our sins. This happened in the spring of 31 AD, right on schedule. He was actually crucified during the feast of the Passover, the very feast which pointed forward to his crucifixion. At this point, the sacrificial system came to an end. The veil in the temple was torn in two. Some have attempted to make this seven-year period of time, from 27 to 34 AD, apply to the Antichrist by separating it from the rest of the prophecy and moving it to an unspecified time at the end of history. But there is nothing in the Bible to warrant this. This is clearly a prophecy about Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. We know the 490 years began in 457 BC. These 490 years were cut off from the 2300 years until the judgment. 2300 years from 457 BC takes us to 1844. Remember to add a year when you cross the BC and AD line. That means that in 1844, the judgment scene depicted in Daniel chapter 7 
verse 9 and 10, began. The judgment is already underway today. In 1844, Jesus began the work of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. Sin and suffering will be eradicated once and for all. This is in keeping with the spectacular warning message given to the world just before Jesus returns. In Revelation chapter 14, 6, and 7, a worldwide message declares that the hour of his judgment is come. At some point, the world will discover that the appointed hour for judgment is already here. We are living at that very moment. How will you fare in the judgment? When Jesus returns, will you recognize him as a friend or will you hardly recognize him at all? There is still time left. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 5, tells us that Jesus will stand for us in the judgment if we will let him. If you look at 1 John chapter 2 verse 1, tells us that he is eager to represent us before the Father. It's entirely up to you.